Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're very well. You're listening to Autistic Voices. I'm Evelyn Charmer. I'm a paediatric therapist and I'm the director of Ed Elf Child Therapy Limited and its sister training company for therapists, the Child Hypnotherapy Institute. And I've recently been diagnosed autistic myself. So I'm very inspired to bring you a diverse and rich range of autistic voices from the community. People who are diagnosed, people who are not diagnosed, people who work alongside and collaborate with autistic families or autistic adults, people who identify as neurodivergent. Please come and join the conversation. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at evelyn, that's E-V-A-L-Y-N-N-E, at child hypnotherapyinstitute.com or contact me via the show. Thank you for joining me with Autistic Voices. Um, our, my guest there of the week on Autistic Voices is a lovely lady called Willow Holloway. So welcome to the show, Willow. Thank you. And and I don't know, some listeners might have heard your first show that we did last year, which was probably, we were just talking, weren't we, off air? That was probably about a year ago now. Yeah, the time's gone really, really quickly. It's gone really quickly. So um, before we get into it, <clears throat> I'll just um, introduce who you are for people so willow does all sorts of things she's a really interesting woman which is why i want her back um on autistic voices and i'm just going to quote from your linkedin profile okay it says willow is a late diagnosed autistic woman same as me and has previously worked with autistic people in residential care um she has delivered consultation events and workshops training for north wales police and loads of other professionals and has an extensive knowledge of autism from both a professional and personal perspective, facilitating interactive sessions which offer an informed insider perspective on autism, which is really important, isn't it? And you also act as an autistic consultant for several organisations locally in Wales, and you offer individual mentoring and support. So there's all sorts we can talk about. But how are you, first of all? I'm good. Not too bad. I'm still Got a little bit of long COVID, so up yeah. and down a bit at times, but starting to get over it, I think. Um, I'm just overworked. <laughs> well, you do so much. And I think like a lot of autistic people that I have interviewed for this show, I'm always absolutely in awe of the amount that people get out there and do and it's just fascinating isn't it and so you are probably overworked but I know that you're really good as well at at recognizing that and being able to look after yourself too so I'm sorry that you're still having long COVID that's that's just another underlying annoyance I imagine it is yeah it's most annoying I've been left with um I have tics and um body jerks and things like that anyway but they've been made quite a lot worse it's one of yeah. the things that was left after covid um and that's caused a few issues but you get you get used to these things don't you you, you have to adapt um and thankfully society is becoming a bit more accepting of difference now so i'm not quite as uncomfortable as i used to be yeah about letting people see that side of my autism as well now well, I always start the show with what we're grateful for. So let's just start with that and then we'll come back to that um, message about ticks, if that's OK. Oh, yeah. um, well, what are you grateful for right now? Um, I'm grateful that the sun's shining and I'm grateful that I get to spend time with my granddaughter who keeps me going. She keeps me young. Oh, how old is your granddaughter? She is five going on 50. <laughs> brilliant <laughs> brilliant oh well that's lovely that's a really lovely start to the show I guess what I'm grateful for today is is being um in the in in this country in the UK at the moment um I don't know how people are coping out there in Europe with the temperatures and the 
fires and all of the problems it's causing. <clears throat> and um, I do sort of really feel for those people. So my heart goes out to them. I'm really mm. grateful to not be among them right now mm -hmm. because we complain about the weather in the UK, don't we? And, and I know you're in Wales, which um, can be quite rainy, but isn't that a relief when you think about the horrendous impact mm. that it can have when mm. the temperature's way too high for what we can normally cope with? Yeah, yes. it's not good, is it? It's quite worrying. I mean, I'm, they've said that we're liable to get really high temperatures in August. And I've already gone out and bought a very, very big paddling pool before they sell out. So yes. I can just spend my day immersed in cool water. Do you know, I've done the same, but I bought yeah. um, an inflatable hot tub. Yeah. I got one last summer. Um, it's like basically an inflatable paddling pool. Yeah. And um, I keep it on cool for those days because I'm like you. I have to immerse in cool water. It's the only thing that makes me sort of be able to manage the day and carry on working and stuff like that. So, okay. Just coming back to what you said about ticks before we get into the sort mm -hmm. of work stuff. Um, I'm interested because um, as a therapist, I'm, I work with young people and mostly autistic young mm -hmm. people or new divergent kids. And I'm working with uh, a few children who experience ticks mm -hmm. as well. And um muscular body jerks you said but yeah. also vocal tics and I guess where I'm coming from as a therapist is I think the most harmful thing is suppressing them isn't it oh gosh yeah I mean um there's been a big thing recently about Lewis Capaldi hasn't it hasn't there yeah. um and I must admit I'd, I'd heard a few bits of his music before um but I'm a bit older so I'm stuck in my 1980s music usually but somebody sent me the clip of Glastonbury. Um, and then I went and watched his whole set and I could see he was struggling before he even started. Um, and I watched it through and his main concern was that he was letting people down and the more he worried, the more he ticked. Um, and I sat there and I, I classed myself as pretty pretty strong-willed and um, I, I tend to, I'm not overly emotional, but I cried into my coffee that day and it wasn't because I felt sorry for him or I pitied him, but it was that overwhelming empathy that I understood how he was actually feeling at that moment. But I don't think he realised just how much he's done for the ND community. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? Was, it? I, it was amazing. I, I reached out to him actually on Instagram and I'm sure he's been inundated and he hasn't responded, which mm. I wasn't surprised. But I just wanted to say that myself because yeah. I think although it's horrendous watching what he's been going through, and I don't know if you're aware, but he made a documentary about it. I, I went off and did a deep dive afterwards, as as you do. And as I you do, yeah. Um, and, well, it's so me. moving, isn't yeah. it? But I think what you're yeah. right, what he's done is he's brought it to the masses and... All of those people at Glastonbury, and actually a few months ago, he did a gig somewhere else where the same thing happened. And then yeah. he's had a break between then and Glastonbury because he wanted to do Glastonbury. It's been his yeah. his lifelong ambition, yeah. I suppose. It's the it's the height, isn't it, mm. of of music? You can song, see sing a song burner, though, can't you? I mean, just yeah. looking at him, and I, absolutely, I think and that's it's... what gave me that empathy because I've been in burnout a few times myself. Yeah. And your ticks do get a lot, lot worse. Yeah. And it's um, like it's like panic attacks. When you've experienced one mm, bout in yeah. public, you the fear of it happening again creates yeah. more anxiety and stress on your body. Yeah. That yeah. then it you, it does get worse. So it does I and think, it's painful. People don't realise that actually, like you said, that's suppressing them. Yeah. Just makes it even worse. It's it's physically painful. Mine are quite can be quite violent jerks and it tends to be my shoulder. Yeah. Um, and it's I, very I common one, isn't it? agony so. afterwards. Yeah. And um, as I say, I'm working with some children at the moment who are saying exactly those things and they're very young, mm. you know, they're under 14 mm. and they're really struggling to, uh, with the pain, with the physical pain and, you know, really explaining how it can really freeze up your shoulders, your neck. Oh. 
you know, your all your muscles, your jaw, yeah. real pain in the throat, not being able to swallow, not being able mm-hmm. to eat sometimes, and having lots of phlegm and yeah. things like that. And I was talking to one young man just early today um, about whether he suppresses his burps <laughs> and what that might be like and yeah. trying to help him to make friends with his tics yeah. in that, you know, it's no different from, yeah. you know, allowing out a trump or, yeah. or a yeah. burp. Um, and I think that's it. And it's, but, you know, the more that we suppress these things about us, whatever they are, the more yeah. they hold in the body becomes mm-hmm. somatic, I think is the word. Yeah. And the more that it, it causes physical issues, doesn't it? Yeah. Medical pain. So, okay. So since you came on the podcast before, which is about a year ago, and for those listeners that listen to you then, I'm sure they're really keen to hear some updates, but also for anyone who hasn't listened to that one, um, can you just give a sort of a whistle-stop tour of all the work you're doing and what's going on? Okay, I shall get my mind map out. I know no, look at that. It, I wish listeners could see that. That is fantastic. It's got so bad that I have to keep a mind map. To I love a mind map, though. <laughs> with what I'm doing. So, yes, yeah, so I'm do, still doing masses of work with um, Autistic UK. Um, since we came on the podcast last, we've now got an office in Clendid No, um, with a training room attached to it. So we're able to do more things there. Um, we're working... Um, with our local health board to implement a new piece of guidance that Welsh Government released, which was the um, Code of Practice on the Delivery of Autism Services. So um, Betsy Cadwalder University Health Board are working with us to implement that so that it's implemented across the health board with all staff. Um, We're still working with the Integrated Autism Service, and I think since the podcast, I was also asked to be co-chair of their strategy board so that they've actually got autistic representation on the on the board that's leading in a in a decision making capacity so that's really good um the other thing that i have done re- since is um our welsh government are looking at a neuro developmental improvement program so they've changed the way they're engaging I've I've done quite a lot with Welsh government over a few years now but often it was very much it was just one or two of us that sat on a strategy group Um, but they've really massively improved on that now and they've developed a ministerial advisory group on neurodivergent conditions um, and there's quite an equal balance on there between autistic and non-autistic and making sure that there's other representation from other ND conditions on there as well. So that was really good because we had to apply for that this time. It wasn't something that you were invited to. You actually had to apply so that they could get that balance of skills and diversity that they needed on there. What's and what's your role on that um, advisory um, group? I'm just I'm just a member of the advisory group, but one of our other directors from Autistic UK is actually co-chairing that as well. So that's brilliant. Um, we're still working uh, with an organisation called Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales on um, Women's Health Plan for Wales. So that's a brilliant one as well. Um, With Autistic UK, we're still running some peer support groups and we're also supporting some other groups to set up now. So taking what we've learned and I suppose if you like the potholes that we found and making sure that people don't have the same struggle as setting up as we did yeah, um, and helping support some smaller groups by being able to access some funding for them. Because Gosh, it's, it's really been, growing. No wonder you need a mind map. It's just... It, yeah, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? I mean, I, I do, I do um, presentations sometimes. And um, what the presentation that I'm doing this year is talking very much about change makers because we've got... We've got a lot of media coverage of autistic people. And don't get me wrong, they have their place. So people like Christine McGuinness and... Um, all 
even um, what's his name? Owen Jones just came out as ADHD and things like that. Yeah, so Robbie we've Williams. Got, we've got a lot yeah, of high profile people. Yeah, so you've got that high, pro- high profile. Um, <laughs> and you've also then got like social media influencers who've got these huge platforms. But there's a lot of change makers who don't want to be in the public eye. Yeah. They don't want to be all over social media and they do their work behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I've been making a big thing about the fact that actually you don't have to be this big global superstar or make massive changes to be a change maker, that you can actually sit on strategic panels, sit on your local steering group, even just reaching out a hand to other autistic people. Yes. That's enough to make change. So we'd, we'd, we've got a big focus on that at the minute. That's lovely. Um, and that sort of also encourages us to connect with other communities. So in my case, it's the, um, the disabled community because I, I do a lot of work with Disability Wales as well. And that's something else that happened since I last spoke to you. I was vice chair, I think, when I spoke to you, you last. You were, yes. Um, and I became chair this year. Oh, well done. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, chair who'd been in the role, she'd been in the role about 15 years. Um stepped down and retired and I was next in line so I was really really proud to do their um it was our 50th 50th anniversary at Disability Wales um so we did a big celebration event and we did a big conference and I got to chair the chair the the AGM at the conference and me yeah well, it's no mean feat Willow I've, I've I've been a chair there might be people out there saying well what does a chair even do but yeah. I've been a chair of um <clears throat> big not a massive organization as disability wales i have to yeah. say but i've been a chair of various things and it's a lot of work and you i love it man- no. <laughs> i loved it as well i loved I it. Love it i found it fascinating but it's not sometimes the perception might be that you're just sitting there and you're just I'll helping people get through a meeting and it's not that at all is it can you say a bit more about what um, it means to you well it's very much about sort of making sure that that the meetings that you're doing run correctly and keep on track um which can be quite difficult when you're in a room full of passionate people um disability wales runs a bit smoother than autistic uk autistic uk we we do have a tendency to go down rabbit holes and the conversation can go that's not a massive surprise at all i think that's that's just part and parcel isn't it yeah um (laughs) <laughs> but obviously, from like, from what I've said already, we, we deal with quite a lot of major issues. Exactly. And and I think the thing about being a chair is it's not just making sure meetings kind of run smoothly and they come to a, a an end. It's about making sure that your organisation is following their own values, that you've got clear outcomes, that you're working to set plan of how you're taking those values and outcomes forward, that mm-hmm. what you're doing is meaningful. Yeah. And that's a lot a strategic kind of work isn't it behind the scenes that you need to do it is and it's it's something we struggled with a bit more at at autistic uk because we we work a bit more outside the box if you like um some charities are very set in their structure but because we're a cic and actually run by quite a small team a very dedicated team but a small team we do tend to be a bit more flexible in the way we work and way we approach things. Yeah, and there's nothing um, wrong with that. You're still achieving and yeah, but moving it does, forward. It does scare off business support and things like that. Yeah. So as soon as you say you use a lead, most business support goes running for the hills. Right. Why do you think uh, that is? Um, I think a lot of it could be down to the stigma that surrounds autism still and the stereotypes. Um and that lack of knowledge of how to work with us because we need flexible working. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know for me, I do my best work at between 10 o'clock at night and three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And it doesn't fit into the way society is set up. Well, there, you know, I think what it's a really nice way to think about when you said outside of the box. And I think for a lot of autistic people I speak to, and certainly I speak for myself here, my, my comment when people used to talk about outside the box thinking was, is there a box? No yeah. one told me there was a box. 
<laughs> and I think that's it. It's kind of, you know, doing things in ways that are organic and creative yeah. and just, you know, that things that come up and you do get very enthused and motivated and passionate. You can go off and down rabbit holes and things, but it's usually super productive way to work yeah. as well, but it's not that confined and, yeah. you know, that can be challenging and it also can be amazing. It's both those yeah. things, isn't it? So yeah. what what are you excited about when all of this? I mean, you've talked about... Well, my, my biggest one at the moment is um, I was approached... Obviously, I've been working with Disability Wales for years now, but I was approached by the Welsh Government to sit on their Disability Rights Task Force. Um, massive achievement. I'm just so, I'm just so proud of myself. Um, and so you should be. And they asked me to chair their health and well-being working group. Um, obviously, with the fact that we've just come out of a pandemic mm. and the, all yeah. the issues with the NHS at the moment, I know. it was a very, very intense working group. Um, but we're, what we're doing is we're developing the disability plan for Welsh Government which will look at how what work they're going to do over the coming years. Um, and it's um, it's so co-productive. It's the time. Usually you sit in these groups and if you're lucky as a disabled or autistic person, you'll get five minutes to quickly say what you need to say. Whereas this is a real co-productive approach between policymakers, service providers, and disabled people themselves, they're there in equal numbers. And actually the lived experience is listened to first. And then service providers and policymakers feed in. Um, and obviously I can't say too much yet because it's the reports haven't been written. But those, I, I, I can see real change coming in Wales for disabled people. And pur- purposely because it's been disabled people leading the conversations this time. It's a really good model, isn't it? Yeah. It's really, it's really motivating to hear about that. Mm. Um, and how you've described the co-production um structure of how yeah. it works and that the policymakers come in later. And actually it's it's all about the service users first and the yeah. lived experience first. Yeah. Um, but the great that, thing is we're in the same room as well. Yeah, in the same Whereas room. Whereas usually they separate you down. Um, and and these, all in the same room, it's brilliant. That sort of five minutes thing you were talking about a minute ago, you know, it, it just feels really tokenistic, doesn't it? Mm. Like you're ticking a box, being, being um, just representing and not really actually co yeah. producing or collaborating. No, and in Wales, we are massively moving towards um, the social model of disability. Yeah, so like Welsh, it. Welsh government have adopted the social model of disability and are intending, as time goes on, to implement it within all their policy. Well, well um, done, Wales. That's all I can yeah, say. That, I mean, that's a massive, massive move forward. Massive that move includes forward. Includes co-production. Yeah. If you're looking at that model, then that model pushes for co-production. I love that. But, that's yeah, all really exciting and positive. Excellent. And going back to what you said earlier, Willow, about the Welsh Government setting up a neurodevelopment programme, yeah. or a neurodevelopment improvement programme, I think it's mm-hmm. called, and they've got a ministerial advisory group. Can you tell us any more about that? Because that's also really exciting. Yeah, the ministerial advisory group is there to advise and, and sort of steer the improvement programme. Um, and that looks at all sorts of areas. Um, You've got the children. It's very much an all-age strategy, Um, but obviously you've got the neurodevelopmental services that work with children, and then you've got the integrated autism service that works with adults, um, which is quite (laughs) quite a a different thing in itself with the integrated autism service, because here in Wales you can self-refer for diagnosis. Or what should I say assessment? Because you're not guaranteed a diagnosis, but you can you can self refer for assessment. Um, they're looking at developing um, a no wrong door approach, which was it's the way um, children's services hopefully work in Wales. That actually a diagnosis shouldn't lead the care. You get your needs; it should be needs based. Um, but they're looking at implementing that no wrong door approach for ND as well. 
um, but also the um, neurodevelopmental improvement program, rather than being purely focused on autism, they've recognised that actually ADHD community, the Tourette's community are all having major problems accessing diagnosis and after support. So this new program will initially look at autism, ADHD and Tourette's um, and look at pathways and everything else to support them. Um, and there's been massive, there's a lot of consultation going on again there so that they seek the views of the community. Um, it's going to be a long process. There's a lot of work to do, especially around ADHD. Um, I'm also working on the ADHD advisory group with the of national. Of course you are. <laughs> well, it all sort of, in, this is the thing, it all, in, all interlinks. It's a bit like a, it's a bit like a spider's web. Well, yeah. And looking at that mind map in front of you, all the different mm. colours, I can see that the dots are starting to join up, aren't they? And yeah. they're not starting to. I mean, some of them were already joined up, but yeah. you can see the development and growth of yeah. communicating between all of these groups and how they might fit together. Yeah. Um, but there's only one willow. So um, how do you I'm... spread yourself around and how do you how do you decide where you're going to focus your time and attention? As, considering you're also neurodivergent, and I know what that can be like is being for me, I can get really, really hyper focused on one thing and I find it easy to do loads of different mm -hmm. things and compartmentalize them but i can only do one at a time so if i'm if i'm writing training i'll spend three days writing training yeah. and i find it really hard to integrate other things into that i can do it but i find it difficult so how does it work for you being able to you know manage all of these different sort of se separate entities and organizations and where you fit in with them all i think the fact that sort of i sit at a director level really helps especially with Disability Wales, because we've got a really good staff team. Um, so at Disability Wales, it's very much about keeping an eye on governance and having good ideas that we can then pass on to the staff team to develop. Um, Autistic UK, we delegate. Um, we do as much between us as we can. I'm not the only one who sits on strategy groups. All the other directors sit on strategy groups. Um, and... I suppose uh, I'm also waiting for an ADHD assessment. <laughs> and I actually think the level of work that I do keeps me level. I'd be I'd be more unbalanced if I wasn't busy. Yes. And I need to keep my brain occupied or else it goes down roads that I don't want it to go down. Um, and I suppose passion drives me and motivation. Having ND kids and ND grandkids, I want to make the world a better place for them. It's not about me. Yeah. Um, and that, do you know, there's something very beautiful about that, isn't there? But also, I think, like you're saying, from a self preservation point of view, yeah, I, I agree with you completely. But sometimes people say to me, Oh, your, your life's all about work. And I'm one of those, I, I live to work per mm. people rather than work to live. And I feel like, um, I always say to people, I'm a bit like a missionary without the religious bit. <laughs> I've got a mission. I'm on a mission. I feel like my whole life is all about, you know, um, this meaning around helping children and young people. Mm. That's where that's where I get my kicks. It's where I feel valuable. It's where mm. I focus my attention. But when I'm not working, I don't know quite what to do in the world. And mm. I, I, I much prefer to be spending my time in a way that I see as valuable and contributing and yeah. thinking and getting ideas and developing stuff and all of that. So I'm totally with you. And, and, and across the years, I'm 55 now, but over my career, I've done sort of like the same as you. I've done a bit here and a bit there and part-time this and part-time that. And it's almost all becomes all full-time because <laughs> yeah. yeah. you never switch off from it, really. Um, yeah. But how do you manage to compartmentalise your time between the different requirements of what people need from you in order to fulfill those roles? How do I you suppose do I'm really lucky in the fact that, I mean, at the moment I'm involved in quite a lot of research as well, but I'm there for me. I'm there for my lived experience. So it's not as if I'm having to go out and learn lots and lots of new things for each role, because basically my role is the same in every organisation that I'm working with. It's, it's as, basically an, N, an ND consultant. I'm there to give my experience 
on living with autism or ADHD or whatever we're there to talk about that day. Um, so it really yeah, is. It's, I, I, people keep saying, I should, do, do you find it hard? Do you find, I bet you're exhausted, but no, I'm not. I just, I do like, I do make sure now that I, I self care and weekends are now mine because I did used to let work sneak into weekends. Um, but I'm starting to be a bit tough on myself and I, because I miss out on family time and things like that if I don't. So, yeah, it's just been a bit strict on yourself, isn't it? And making sure that you do do put that self-care in there as well. Yeah, 100%. And I think the thing is, is um, <clears throat> I do work quite a lot of weekends because I train, do I deliver training on quite a few weekends. But what mm. I try to do is if I do that, I'll have a Monday off. Yeah. I say I have a Monday off. <laughs> I'll do a bit of work in the morning and then I'll try and have a few hours off, but I will try and claim that time back. Or um, I like what you said about you do your best work between 10 PM and 3 AM. And I yeah. guess that's un- uninterrupted because no one else is working that's at that right. time. Yeah. I'm, I'm super hypersensory as well. Hmm. Um, so that's when the world's starting to calm down. So it's yeah. a little quieter. I don't hear noise from the neighbors and things like that. So I haven't, like you say, haven't got those distractions yeah and you're not getting inundated with emails that might take your attention somewhere else and yeah I've also got a slightly slightly skew if circadian rhythm as well so it's (laughs) that it's nothing new that's how I've always been I always used to say that autism sleeps but not when you want it to (laughs) (laughs) brilliant I love that and also who's to say when we're meant to work sleep or whatever I think it's that thing of there not being a box for us you know for a lot of ND people is you know you do what comes natural it's like if I feel I need to sleep in an afternoon I'll go and sleep yeah and then I might work really late yeah but I'll go with my own rhythm and I'll go with what feels right. Obviously I've got clients and things. So I do work and like, you've got meetings and things you you can work to a timetable, but when it's all the other stuff that you need to do, I will go with my natural rhythm. Yeah. You just fit it in when you can, don't you? Um, Yeah. And when it feels right to do it as well. So I'm also, I don't know about you, but it's like, for example, I I do design and deliver a lot of training. So if I'm in the designing phases Mm. um, or all all of the sort of admin and marketing, all of the other things that go with running a business, whatever, Mm. I might plan to do that at set time. But if my energy doesn't feel like it's there 100 percent, I won't beat myself up about not doing it that day. I'll I'll, I'll do it another time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the work I do is voluntary, but I think that's one of the reasons as well that a lot of neurodivergent people fit well into self-employment. Yeah, because you have got that flexibility around timings and things like that. So and it's your energy levels, isn't yeah. it? And when when your brain's working on all cylinders, and when it's just absolutely needs to rest. Yeah, and you might have. I mean, for me, I've I've always I'm working for myself now, and I'm loving mm. that, suiting mm. me down to the ground. But that in the past, I've always had jobs and been around people. I I didn't know I was autistic till two years ago, mm-hmm. but I wondered why I really struggled with decompressing and. Um, you know, being around people, even if they're mm. lovely people, but just being around people all day and in buildings, and I'm very sensory to noise and sound mm. and light and things like that. I can't work in offices where there's bright lights and things. I, I look red on my podcast here that I know listeners can't see me because I I work under a sort of orangey coloured light. Yeah. Um, things like that. Or people thought I was weird because I would have my main meal at 10 o'clock in the morning. I used to have a roast dinner every single Ooh. day at 10 a.m. <laughs> Yep. And I couldn't understand why other people didn't or thought that was odd, you know. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it does help for me being self-employed because I can do all of those things and be as quirky as I like and work within my own hour, you know, how I go. Yeah. Um. And not have to fit into those kinds of unwritten rules and social yeah. expectations. Yeah. Um. Okay. So any challenges that you experience being neurodivergent and super passionate and busy and a grandma and a mum and all those other things. I think what you were talking about, about admin, I suppose that's mine, is I love doing the representation work. I love doing the engagement, um, peer support. I thoroughly enjoy doing that, but the admin that goes with it and that promotion, promoting is an issue that I come across. I find it really difficult to actually promote the work that I'm doing. 
and put myself out, like we said about that public eye. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is um, a redesign on our UK's website because we're doing so much now that people need to know what we're doing. Um, so that's going okay, going okay. We're getting there on learning new skills. This Never thought at 55 I'd be designing websites, but there you go. Um, and I've, I'm writing a blog that I'm going to be really brave and publish, press a button on. I do it on my birthday. Um, so, yeah, that's one. Um, I don't come across many challenges because I work with such good teams of people. Um, I mean, at the minute, I'm working with um, Dr. Amy Grant from Swansea University. We're doing um, a really amazing research project. It's an eight-year ex extended project on autism from menstruation to menopause. So a really, really important area that hasn't yeah, that much research done around it. Um, but even there, we're doing it in a completely different way. Um, we've seen a big move towards participatory research. But this is autistic-led research. Oh, exciting. So Sounds like it, Swansea are quite forward-thinking with that. They are. they are. I did see on your um, LinkedIn recently, you posted an interesting message from a PhD student at Swansea, mm -hmm. Hayley Morgan, who's doing yeah. some research into autistic birth experiences. Yeah. So, do you know much about that? Is there anything? Yeah, Hayley's brilliant. Oh, I, I love Hayley. She's written a book on the autistic birth experience and that's been published now. So that's available. I think it's available on Amazon. Um, she's also part of um, a new research collaborative called Marge, which is the maternity autism research group. Um, I do sit on a couple of their groups as sort of a lay person, but it, there's midwives in there, there's healthcare workers in there um, and they're all autistic. Um, and they've come together to create a resource around maternity and pregnancy and birth and everything else. Um, and that's available online now. So that's the Maternity Autism Research Group, known as Marge. If you do a search on Google, that will take you to there. Um, yeah. Another one of our directors, Kat Williams, she also plays a big role in Marge. Um, she's doing research at the moment around healthcare for autistic people for a PhD. Um, but we've also done a recently, and I don't think, no, they haven't been released yet, but recently we did some work around pregnancy with Dr. Amy as well. Um, and there's going to be a series of very short films released that talk about the challenges that you might experience while you're pregnant and um, when you're in hospital giving birth and the after time. Um, I really never thought that I would be on the internet talking about my boobs. <laughs> well, um, I was put forward why to not? about breastfeeding. So yeah. <laughs> whenever you go to out, there'll be me talking all about it. So we're going to um, have a rush of people Googling you now, Willow. Do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't show my boobs or just talk about them. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so you can see sort of there's all this new research. and everything. Isn't it brilliant? Because, do you know yeah. what, I think it's an area that's been hitherto not ignored but not really explored. So that kind of whole thing of, <laughs> you know, from menstruation to menopause and everything in between, that means to be a woman, mm. um, where, you know, and looking at pregnancy, looking at, childbirth looking at breastfeeding and all of those things so well done dr amy grant and people mm. like Haley morgan who are looking mm. at these things i think it's fascinating it'll be really interesting i'd love yeah, to see i might have a look and see if i can find the amazon book then from Haley morgan well, um, well, I'll, do, I'll send you some links through after the meeting through, just, just yeah. short, shortcut it for you fantastic um and listeners if you get in touch with me after the show then you know i can pass that on it's evelyn e-v-a-l-y-n-e at childhypnotherapyinstitute.com. Um, okay, so I just want to um, go back to what you said about admin and promoting yourself and all of that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, there's a very, I don't know if anyone's out there has noticed, but there's a very clear divisive line between when I used to put my own marketing stuff out 
And when I got a grant from Access to Work and employed mm-hmm. a VA who does a lot of that for me, and you can really see the div- division between the sort of stuff I would tentatively put out myself and the stuff that she does. So I think it's really worthwhile if you are somebody who, whether you're self-employed or you work as an mm-hmm. uh, or you're employed, Access to Work. Uh, there to offer support in all sorts of different ways you can apply for a grant you might not always get it but they they can offer support with things like equipment and having certain equipment that you might need to do your job and it's about giving you equal opportunities so for me uh, well what they do is they ask you to write down all the things that are involved in your job what you're able to do yourself and what you need support with and then they look at how they might make that happen for you and it's been amazing for me I've had the support since December and I'll have it till December but in this what yeah. in this one year it's really helped me loads with even things like you know I'm quite happy to do certain things myself but it's about having someone else to talk you through it and yeah. show you how to do things efficiently because I don't know about you Willow but I can spend hours and hours and hours trying to figure out the most simplest thing like an excel spreadsheet or something yeah. that other people just seem to whiz through whereas when it comes to designing training on I don't know, neurodivergent children using hypnotherapy, I can do that top of my head, absolutely no problem. I can do some quite complex stuff, but when it comes to working out the printer or (laughs) or try, you know, uh, various yeah. things like that I'm, I'm I just it just doesn't compute so yeah it's actually it's one of the things we're looking at at AUK I mean like I said I do my work voluntary because of my health conditions because my health conditions are quite unpredictable so going into employ em, employment as such can be quite difficult for me um but we've got other directors who we'd like to develop what they're doing into job roles and then as soon as we've started bringing in enough money to cover um, wages and things like that, we'll we'll then be looking at access to work for them as well. Because yeah, I do wonder whether to work as a volunteer. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm wondering whether access to work also support people to volunteer because it no, doesn't have to be don't. paid employment. They don't. No, they don't. Well, maybe that's something that it's, them, it's uh, something that we're raising with government actually because. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was somebody said to me the other day when I asked what I did, when they they came back to me, well, it's all right, but it's not a real job, is it? Oh, and it's, it's outrageous because like, it's exactly <laughs> the same as a paid job, except for you're doing it without the money, which exactly. is you know, this, this is the thing. It this is like, the thing. Um, I've the, worked... the, the, the 400 emails that are sitting waiting to be yeah, responded to in my inbox. Tell me your work is. <laughs> Volunteer work is doesn't mean you're less skilled or no, less no, it doesn't valued or important or that you're doing this. It just means that the, you're doing it for no money, and that, yeah. that really annoys me when people devalue volunteers. Yeah, like that. so maybe that's something the ministerial advisory group might be. Yes, it, it's it's yeah. something that we're looking at with the disability rights task force as well. Oh, disability rights! Ta- I love a task force. <laughs> it make, it just makes you think, doesn't it, of some yeah. people sort of marching in these great big, you know? Yeah, we we are going to do something about this, but it's thing that's like there's a big difference between being productive and being employed. Yeah, I and mean, I, I like I said to you, I I do what I do to protect my sanity. Yeah, because I just I don't want to just sit and veg in front of daytime TV. It's it's, well, there's something about our self worth as well as humans yeah. that if we are contributing to something we believe in and are passionate about, if we're contributing to society in some way, it doesn't have to be financially rewarding. No, but it no. is about having a valuable place in yeah. your community, in your society. Yeah, and that's more rewarding on a mental health level, on a you know. A existential level of yeah. why we're here making your life mean something mm-hmm. as well as meaning something to others that is m- far more rewarding than any salary yeah. could ever be you yeah know? I agree I agree and and the people I connect with as well yeah and also what you're doing it's then also is you know educating people you're driving things forward mm-hmm. you're you're a change maker massively, mm-hmm. but you're helping to sort of things to grow for future generations when maybe we're not around yeah. and um, there's something incredible about that as well, isn't it? And me- making your life meaningful for those the very short time we're here on the planet. 
Yes, yes. And meaningful for others as well as for yourself. Yeah, it and goes in the blink of an eye, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I can't believe I'm 55 when I look in the mirror. I, my brain still, still tells me I'm 16. I can't believe I'm 55 either. And I've got a 32 year old son and a 22 year old son. I'm just like, I'm sure I'm still 32, aren't I? Or 22 or something like that. Well, I um, became a great grandma last year. So imagine oh, wow. that one. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not a grandma yet. So, you know, and I might never be. I think it's a real privilege and an honour to be a grandparent and to be a great grandparent is even more incredible to be able to experience that. So I'm really... It does make you feel old. (laughs) I'm sure it does, but also how wonderful. Yeah. Um, Okay, so before we finish then, is there anything you'd like to say about future plans and developments or anything personal that you want to share? I think, I mean, the future plans and developments, we're actually looking at expanding now. And we're going to be having um, a volunteer drive pretty soon, especially with Autistic UK. Disability Wales, we're just, we're we're currently taking on new appointed directors. That's underway now. Um, But Autistic UK, we're looking at having a, a big volunteer drive to start bringing in people so that we've got representation from more areas across the UK. So we don't have to spread ourselves so thinly and so that we can, we'd like to see more youngsters coming in so that we can, like you said, start putting that in place for the next generations so that they under. It's quite hard work. It's getting involved in policy and service development because you have to learn so much, but we'd like to be able to shortcut it for the next lot that are coming in so that the information is already there for them to use. They, we, they already know which legislation they can quote and things like that. Um, so we'll be looking at doing that. Um, and we're also looking at developing our peer support a bit wider. Um, and we'll be able to do that with more volunteers as well. Because yeah, we like to so, keep our groups small. We don't so, like having massive, great big groups. So how can people find out more about volunteering for Autistic UK and maybe looking at that as a possibility for something they might want to get involved in? Okay, so hopefully by the end of the month, I will have the new website up and running and there'll be a page on there about volunteering. Um, They can contact us at info at autisticuk.org with the subject line volunteering. Um, or they can, if they want more of a one-to-one chat about it before they get involved, they can contact me on my email, um, which is willow.holloway at autisticuk.org. That's great. So, um, and what's the sort of, you said about trying to attract younger people. So what kind of age range would be ideal? Um, 18 and over. Um, Mostly because of our insurance, we work more with adults than we do children. Um, but we're looking for all sorts of things, admin support, um, content creators for the websites, um, blog writers, you name it. If you've got a skill, we'll try and fit you in. Because the thing we do, rather than create roles and then ask people to come and fill those roles, what we're doing is asking people to come to us and talk to us, and we will try and create a role that matches your skills. Oh, and I love that. That's total yeah. co-production as well, isn't it? And yeah. so that's reassuring for people that they're not having to sort of try and squash themselves into, yeah. you know, job descriptions and things like that. Um, and also, I guess when you're volunteering, it's about fitting it around you and your life, isn't it? Yeah. And that's yeah. one benefit because although you're not getting paid, it's about, you know, if you're having a day when you're really struggling, you know, do your hours another day. Yeah, and it's exactly. about getting the work done. It's not about you know you have to turn up at this time and do this yeah. and that. And a lot of people can do their work remotely now. Yeah, is that, I was know, just going to say that. Actually, I mean, we do have some office based um, opportunities coming up, but obviously they're in Clandid now in North Wales. Yeah. So if somebody's local to that, then great, we can do some office work. But most of our work is done remotely. Yeah, exactly. So, so it doesn't matter where you are, you don't have to be. I mean, no judgment somewhere. at all because I, I'm quite I'm quite isolated and I like my own space. But I work from my bedroom most of the time. Um it's it's not perfect, but that's how I like to work. Yeah, and it's what that's makes you feel. Great. 
it's what makes you feel comfortable, isn't it? And you're yeah. gonna you're gonna work better if you're not stressed, and yeah. you can use your logical brain and not your stressed yeah. brain. So yeah. it makes complete sense. So I think that's really worth people knowing. And yeah, also, because one of the things as well we found that we've had a few people come in and volunteer in the past, and the skills that they've developed, they've then gone on to get work within the autistic, or oh, well, I should say, autism field. But they've gone on into paid jobs. Yeah. And also with volunteering, you don't have to do a 37 hour week or whatever. No. You can do an hour, can't you? Or I was going to say, that... yes. Some of the minimum we're sort of four hours a week is really the minimum on the roles that we're putting out. Um, but none of them are over part time. Yeah. Well, thanks because for clarifying. Like we were saying about that energy management, we, we're very aware of too many hours can lead to burnout. And that's not something we want for our volunteers. No, and also it manages expectations as well. And I think in terms of um, knowing what new, us neurodivergent people can be like when we get passionate about something, yeah. we can absolutely immerse in it. And that's not particularly healthy all of the time either to go, oh, my gosh, I want to do like uh, this is this is my life and I just want to yeah. do this. And it can be really overwhelming, can't it? So burnout yeah. can happen. So I think it's about managing that as well and saying, look, you know, if four hours a week sounds good. And if that's, you know, what you can what you can offer, that's a brilliant starting point. Yeah. But if yeah. you can do more and you can manage more, then that's great, yeah. too. So thanks for that. So um, info at autisticuk.org or willow.holloway at autisticuk.org. OK, well, it's been lovely to have you on the programme again and so many things so many things going on but all really exciting things and it sounds like you know things are really growing they are, they are. going in the right direction and all done from the comfort of your own bedroom so that's I know it's brilliant isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on Willow and um, I will speak to you soon you're very welcome thank you very much for asking me thank you for listening I'm Evelyn Charmer this is Autistic Voices and special thanks to our guest of the week